Right, it helped if I unneedle my mic. My name is Catherine Barsinesis, and you're watching The Gluttonous Geek Presents Munchies and Minis. Um, Munchies and Minis is a weekly cooking show where I first uh, cook a recipe inspired by Dungeons and Dragons or any other tabletop role playing game, and then work on painting a miniature. Um, I've been doing the 52 weeks of D&D challenge for, well, since I started streaming, and last week the challenge work was good, so we went to the Upper Plains with a pear and goat cheese trifle that was absolutely heavenly. I do not apologize for puns, by the way. This week, the challenge word is Dragonborn, so we are going to be making what I'm calling Dragonborn Delicacy. Now, I had to do a little bit of research into the Dragonborn, since 5th edition doesn't really provide that much beyond a basic race description, I had to actually go to the Forgotten Realms campaign setting where we had this country, um, starts with the T, I actually have it on my email, uh, Tamarin, um, where basically after being slaves to the dragons, uh, the dragonborn escaped and settled their own country essentially. And so then I had to look into how does this factor into cooking? What do dragonborn actually eat? And you're thinking, okay, a lot of meat probably, but there's more to it than that. Um, in basically this river valley, the green fields, there is basically the bread basket of dragonborn society. Um, the green fields are known for having like sesame seeds, rice, barley as their main crops, and also they have a tendency to raise a lot of cows, sheep, goats just a lot of livestock animals. So what I decided to do is kind of take that sort of idea and then go off another dragonborn characteristic, which is to have such passion in skills, in, in crafting things. I mean, a dragonborn does not half-ass anything. So I wanted to make an elevated dish which still represented the various items that the dra uh, dragonborn would be eating. Uh, okay, yes, um, Arush Ashok was the name of their bread basket in the southern lands of Tamanther. So, yeah, we're going off of that. But then, okay, we've got meat, we've got, we've got some lamb, so yeah, I've got some uh, lamb shoulder here. We also have some rustic bread, so I've got a baguette here that we're going to be slicing up. And, of course, sesame oil and sesame seeds. Since um, I also wanted to include some kind of dairy element, since, you know, they're raising cows and sheep, they're probably going to have some kind of cheese. We're going to be making kind of a clotted cream type cheese, mixing ricotta and cream cheese together with some fresh herbs. And for this, I'm going, okay, what else do dragons eat? Well, I decided to go off script a little bit with it. Well, off the beaten path of D&D &D manuals for this, because for one, I couldn't find anything. But for two, thinking, okay, what is the real life equivalent to dragons, or dragonborn, so to speak, in the real world? And I was thinking, you know, there's bearded dragons. So I consulted my husband, the bearded dra dragon expert. We're gonna get one at some point, but he had one. And I was going, okay, what do bearded dragons love to eat and what's safe for them to eat? So he told me, for one, they love mustard greens. So we're gonna be sauteing some of this down with some sesame oil a little bit. They also love strawberries. They also can eat basil and thyme and alfalfa sprouts. So we're gonna make an elevated dish using all of those items today. So, I should probably go ahead and get started as, you know, the sunlight is staring me down the face because daylight savings time. So, I'm just going to switch to our prep cam here. And, oh good, I do have my, did remember to plug in my stovetop cam. Good. So, what I'm going to need, obviously, is a serrated knife. Slice these up into appetizer slice pieces. And just so I can press these together later on, I'm going to, oh goodness, that is a lot of holes in there. Not to worry. So I'm just gonna cut this on the bias into some slices and hopefully we'll be able to get a couple of slices to pile 
stuff on. Right now, it looks like they kind of let this rise a little too long, which, hey, you know, it's great for just kind of putting some butter on, but I need a little bit of substance. That's actually probably why it's a good thing that I'm mixing together cream cheese and ricotta because it'll act as a barrier uh, between the holes of the bread and everything I'm going to be topping, um, everything I'm going to be topping it with. So, I'm just going to do about half inch to inch thick slices. Try to keep them as close to about a half inch as possible. So it's about six, let's get about eight. And if we need more than that, we'll uh, just cut some more. So yeah, as you can see, I can just slap that back together like you would a cake and put that right back in the bag to keep it from going stale. So. Put that back in there. And of course, I'm gonna have to do a bit of prep in addition to that. So, got my mustard greens, about a bunch I got from Beaufort Highway Farmer's Market today. And the way I'm going to show you how to prepare this is very similar to how you would prepare kale. Just like kale, they have this very thick stem in between the leaves, which doesn't really cook down all that well. So I'm going to want to have to, I'm going to have to remove those stems to be able to get the leafy greens that I want for this recipe. So I'm just going to pull out my chef's knife here. And here's a quick lesson how to hold a chef's knife. Do not hold it like this, because as you can see, it's going all over the place. No matter how hold, uh, hard I hold it. What you wanna do is take the index finger of your dominant hand, put it behind the blade here, like right up against the handle. Put your thumb there, it's a pinch, and then comfortably curl your fingers around the handle. So, I mean, I'm holding this as light as possible, not going anywhere. All right, so what I want to do is I want to slice these ribs out, which the fastest way probably to do it is just to fold the leaf in half there and then just draw the edge of the blade along the spine. And there you go. You got some leafy greens. I'm just going to give that a quick chop stick all of that nonsense into a mixing bowl. So yeah. Now the idea is that you're not going to feed this finished dish to a bearded dragon, but if you do happen to have a bearded dragon, if you have any leftover ingredients in the leftover mustard greens, strawberries, or basil, well, you have a tasty snack to share with Tad Cooper. So. Oh, look, I just taught you how to train and, well, feed your dragon anyway. There's a dirty joke in there somewhere. I'm not really sure where yet. Okay. All right. Is there much of a stem there? Not really. I'm just going to roughly chop that up. Yeah, when I cook this down, all of this is just going to 
wilt down to about, I want to say like a third of what I'm chopping up. So admittedly, I bought two bunches of mustard greens today thinking that I'm going to need all of it, but we'll see how much volume I get out of this batch. Probably only going to need this bunch if I only do eight slices. Maybe I should do tw I should do 12. That way, if you have a par uh, gaming party of about six, that way you can at least have let everyone have two slices. I do want to thank people who are joining me tonight. I mean, I admit it was very hard to uh, get off my butt and start streaming, especially since I was uh, over listening on SJ to, uh, Trooper's channel. He is currently reading, or I guess he might be done with it now, um, Atlanta Nights, which is honestly, it. It's so bad that gives Belinda Blinks a run for its money. It's hilariously bad, intentionally so this time, but it's, oh goodness. I'm just going, dang it, I have to stream in five minutes. I'm supposed to be setting up my kitchen. I'm not making bad jokes about grammar. But here I am and my taste buds, I'm sure, will thank me for it. Also, if you're watching this later, Chelsea of a uh, well, little red dot. It's her birthday today. She's uh, over at J Joystick Bar celebrating the big 3 0. So. But yeah. I said my taste buds will thank me for this and I'm sure you I'm sure yours will too all right let's see how many more I should actually pile this up where I need it so I can see how much I've got left not too long too not too much longer Yeah, um, I admit that last week when I saw that the uh, 52 weeks of D&D challenge work this week was Dragonborn, no idea what to do whatsoever. I mean, just thinking meat on top of meat on top of meat, and just, I don't know, that felt a little lazy, and I wanted to make sure that it really did focus on... Um, the Dungeons and Dragons content as much as I could. But, uh, yeah, next week, the challenge word is injury. And what I'm really tempted to do is actually do a reference of uh, the D&D podcast North by Northwest. During their Momocon show, the characters had to compete in a cooking contest and since it was kind of battle, battle is with the audience as to what the type of uh, dish that should be made was um, it's select a type of dip, type of food and a spell, a D&D spell so they chose pasta of inflicts wounds 
So yeah, I think I'm gonna try to figure out how to make a pasta of inflicting wounds. Oh, yeah. I don't want any mustard greens in my stock. I mean, how I'm gonna do that? Well, um, considering, have you ever tried to make zoodles before? Um, best way I can describe it is noodles or pasta made out of spiralized, um, what's it called? Zucchini. Well, I've got a jetty here. I hate it. I also hate my mandolin, and the biggest thing that I hate about it is I still haven't really quite figured out how to make zoodles without, you know, cutting myself. Even with the handhold, it still happens. I mean, you get the zucchini a little too far in there and you just end up slicing your finger open and it sucks. So, I can at least try to figure out how to make a safer way of doing zoodles without having to spend too much money. Um, that's that's the idea I've got so far. Actually, yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and cut up those extra four slices of baguette while I'm thinking about it, though. Um, the week after that, the challenge word is dwarf. So, once again, I'm thinking about referencing another one of my favorite podcasts, The Adventure Zone. Since Merle High Church is a beach dwarf, and this the summer, I was thinking, why not do a beach dwarf recipe? Or two. I mean, got a few ideas, maybe uh, like a mead and um, maybe a mead and apple scallop ceviche or something. Um, haven't really quite figured that out. Just ideas. Or something maybe called a, maybe a dwarven version of a pina colada. That could be fun. One, two, three. And four. All right. Cool. And I still got a nice amount of bread for uh, either breakfast or lunch tomorrow or both. Okay. I am done with that. I'm just going to twist that up. It's sticking. Should be fine in the fridge. Otherwise, it's, it's very warm and humid down in Atlanta right now, so it'll just go moldy on my countertop, unfortunately. All right, so I've got my greens, I've got my bread. Now I just need to go with the less messy item and bring out my herbs. I think I'm going to try to do about a quarter cup each of chopped up basil and well, maybe a quarter cup of chopped up basil and maybe an eighth of a cup of fresh thyme. So let me just update my recipe here. By the way, if you, have, uh, if you want access to the finished recipe card, I have them available on Ko-Fi and my Patreon. Uh, Patreon, you can access to all the munchie, Munchies and Minis recipe cards. Uh, as you see, it's episode 17, so there's currently about 16 recipe cards published and on the Patreon. Um, for about $5 a month at the Twitch, uh, Twitch Witch level, you can get access to all of that, as well as my cook-along playlists uh, for each of my blog post recipes. Uh, you'll also have a chance of getting a fun, random surprise. Um, like I said, this is also a mini painting show. So I kind of cycle around uh, who receives the mini that I've painted each month, as well as a character sheet that goes along with said mini. Um, so, uh, yes, I need to write that down. So yeah, if you want to hit that, if my stream deck is working, I'll just pop in it into the chat. I need to figure this out, the uh, stream deck at some point, so 12 slices. And if, also, if you're taking notes, you can go ahead and take down this note. So 12 slices of baguette at half an inch thick. And let's see, about one bunch of mustard greens, ribs removed, 
roughly chopped. Okay. So let's start with our basil, and I just need to get some prep dishes here really quick. Put these things in. And a measuring cup or two. So we have eighth of a cup and a quarter of a cup. Here we are. Ooh. So I finish off my mezcal and sake lime juice thing. We're low on mixers, admittedly. Mm. Okay, and then open up a hand of the queen. Yeah, we still have some um, Game of Thrones beers left over from our season finale party. So. I have not had a chance to try this yet. This is a barley wine ale, a beer for Tyrion, a full-bodied expression of classic rich and multi barley wine ale brewed for those who drink and know things. Well, I drink and I know some things. And I know that I like this beer, so A+. plus. All right, so I am going to need a quarter cup of fresh chopped basil. So, just need to strip some leaves. Never thought you'd be seeing stripping on a cooking show, huh? All right. So, let's see how much I get out of this. So, to prep these, you want to cut them in a chiffonade pattern. Now the way to do this is first you gather up all of those fresh basil leaves and then separate your prep dishes so they don't make it a really annoying sound when you accidentally hit them as you're working. And just bunch them all up on top of each other as flat as possible and mostly in just in one direction. It doesn't have to be perfect, you just need to have it work. So gather those all together. Next up, you want to roll them together. And yes, I'm aware it looks like something. Something else that's also associated with the term herb. Something else that I'm not really sure if I can mention on a PG stream, but you understand what I'm trying to say. So, just kind of roll that all up together. just like that. Next, you take your chef's knife wherever you happen to put it. Mine just happens to be right here. And you just want to cut in a rocking motion some ribbons along the side. And after you've done that, just give it a rough chop. Let's see how much we got out of that. Got a quarter cup right here. Okay. That is roughly, actually perfectly, a quarter cup. So. I'm just going to take out another mixing bowl here and dump that into it. And set that to the side. Now I'm going to need, well, I'm not going to need these, apparently. Fresh time. So I've got an eighth of cup measuring cup right here and a bunch of French, uh, fresh time. Gonna grab a big hunk of that out of the rubber band that's holding it. Aha. Okay. And separate it into separate stalks. It's gonna make things a lot easier for you if you do this this way. As annoying as this may seem, it's gonna make it a lot less annoying when you actually try stripping these things. A 
one's going to add a bit of sweetness to your mix. So that's why we're using it for this particular dish. Considering the mustard greens have a tendency to be kind of bitter. So this is going to help balance that some. And the reason why I'm putting herbs in the cheese is that cheese is a fat. I know, duh. And fat is a flavor carrier. So, I mean, I remember, like, ever remember when you were a kid and your parents were trying to, like, buy a bunch of fat-free food and, well, at least my brother would uh, exclaim that fat-free equals no taste. Well, there's a reason for that because fat is a flavor carrier. It is necessary to make sure that you have all the various flavors in your dish marry with each other. So, it doesn't necessarily have to be a saturated fat, but, uh, Fat is still important and also, you know, important for your health in moderation. So, and as you see, I'm just kind of keeping the stems here. The reason why I'm doing that is multi purpose. You see, there's still a lot of flavor to be had within herb stems. You don't want to just throw these things out because after they've served their purpose in your dish, what you can do is take all those herb stems you have and put them into a freezer bag with onion peels, chicken bones, all the various kitchen scraps that still contribute, can contribute flavor like carrot, uh, carrot peels, um, celery ends. Just stick that into your freezer bag and once that's all filled up, put the whole mix into a crock pot, fill it with water, have it cook on low for about eight hours, and then you'll get about 10 to 12 cups of stock that you can cook rice with, or make soup with, or just make sauces with. Chili, it all works out. Uh, for example, I before this stream tonight, I managed to get about, I wanna say, 11 cups of chicken stock out of my last batch. I just put them into Tupperware containers like this so I have them ready to go. Um, already pre-measured out so I don't even have to use a measuring cup for any wet goods when I make up a pot of rice. So I know exactly how much is in that Tupperware. So, so yeah. Considering that I know that fresh herbs can get a little pricey when you go to the supermarket, uh, depending on where you are, that way you're getting double usage out of your fresh herbs. That, and if they happen to go all dry on you before using them, well, just stick the whole thing into the bag and you still get your money's worth. So. A lesson on kitchen economy for the day and I realize my stomach is sticking into the frame that is totally flattering so I could just take the camera back but eh, whatever. oh boy I'm just kind of spreading the leaves off of the stalk directly into the container. But apparently I also learned another trick today with fresh thyme. Apparently you can reduce the process of stripping leaves off if you just freeze the bunch and then um, just kind of rough up the stem bed and it has all the leaves fall off easily. Now granted then you just want to use it for whatever as soon as possible because then it'll turn into a mush if you just let it thaw out as it is. But you know if you buy a bunch of fresh herbs and you don't really know what you're going to use it for immediately then it's not just going to go to waste.
And I'm, you're probably wondering, why is this taking so long? Well, that's the thing. Prep is actually one of the... It's actually the longest part of the cooking process. Unless you do a lot of pre-prep or meal prep. I could be better about it, admittedly. But I also bought these ingredients today. That and part of this demonstration is to show you techniques that you can, yourself can use in the kitchen. So, you know, say you just buy this and have the game session tomorrow. Well, just do all this prep ahead of time. Do all this prep the night before. That way it's just a matter of quick cooking and assembly right before your game party shows up. Or, you know, if you only want to make a partial portion and eat a little bit at a time. So. So, funny thing about cooking and gaming, well, not really funny thing, just more things are coming up. Uh, if you've ever heard of the series The Gamers, or The Gamers Darkness Rising, or even the series Journey Quest uh, by Zombie Orpheus, they are having their Season 4 Kickstarter going on right now. And I'm super excited about the next season. I mean, the quality has only gone up more and more with every every episode. Um, the writing is fantastic, the acting is excellent, and the story is just knocked down hilarious. Um, but yeah, their season four Kickstarter is going on, and I've already done about two recipes, well, published two recipes inspired by their series. Uh, first was a pineapple cheesecake tart with red pepper jelly, inspired by Red Birdsong Bard. The other was... Um, a raspberry cream filled scone with mixed berries inspired by Perf the Wizard. Um, those recipes are already still up on the blog, thegluttonousgeek.com. Uh, if you're interested in knowing what the next one, what recipe I'm doing is, um, tune in the blog because it's coming out this week. Uh, it's inspired by our, the smoldering goblin character, Rilk. And I mean, if you've seen season 3.5, you would know what it is. But I'm going to be releasing the recipe a bit early to help drum up some support for the Kickstarter because not only uh, did they ask me to do this recipe, um, they filmed the actors who play the characters making them. The videos aren't out yet. I'm super excited to see them. I've only seen screenshots of um, this most recent recipe that I did. And they've also asked me to make up about up to three recipes that are completely exclusive to the Kickstarter, as in the only way you're going to get access to these is if you go support them. Um, I'm not even putting these on the blog, and I don't know what they're going to be yet. Um, partially is that they need to send me some... Um, some history info about the campaign setting that their film series is based off of, but I'm super excited about making those up. Um, I've already got a few ideas at the moment, some pertaining to past locations from uh, season three, and maybe some of the monsters too from season one. But yeah, um, their Kickstarter actually ends in the next, I want to say, 30 to, 30 to 40 days. So if you want to check that out, uh, just look up Zombie Orpheus, and that should lead you at least to their website. Also, if you just want to catch up on all of Journey Quest's, uh, se well, seasons one through three, all of it's on YouTube right now. As in, you can watch it for free all three seasons of hilarity. So I highly suggest that uh, later after this stream. Because they're 
video se movie series are this kind of hilarious fantasy fantasy tropes and how the tropes don't always work or uh, sometimes the, tr the tropes lead to something other than what the narrative often dictates it to be. Okay, so that's about an eighth a cup of fresh thyme. I'm just going to throw what's left of that into my freezer stock bag. <laughs> Nothing else to clear off my kitchen so I can continue to work on everything else. Now, the reason why I did these before the strawberries is that I didn't really want strawberry juice all over my cutting board. And I guess I can always get another one out, and I need to get another one out because I need to get on my, I need something to slice my lamb up. So. I believe that this should be room temp by this point. But in the meantime, let's just go ahead and throw that eighth of a cup of fresh thyme into my mixing bowl with the chopped up basil. As I update, and also if you're taking notes, quarter cup fresh chopped basil, and eighth of a cup of thyme leaves. Okay. As for what's left of this basil, well, I could use it for garnish. Or I can just wrap it up in a paper towel so it doesn't get all wilty on me and put it all back in the fridge for another day, along with my fresh thyme. Right, so I'm going to need a chopping board by chopping board, I mean the kind that has the little grooves around the edges. And I've suddenly realized a reason for my prep dish to put my strawberries. So, I'm just going to start out with about three at the moment. slice off the top and then cut about I want to say quarter inch thick slices of strawberry I think we're gonna do about two slices per piece so let's do about that's about four oh good slices there. So yeah, we should get what we need from about three strawberries, but I'm going to slice up another one just in case. I mean, you can always snack on the rest of them. Or, you know, give your bearded dragon a snack with the rest of them. That's not quarter of inch thick at all, but meh. So, strawberries. There you go. Put these away. As well as the rest of my mustard greens. And the reason why I'm doing this is that it helps kind of absorb any excess moisture that comes off of my greens to keep it from getting all wilty and gross in the refrigerator.
Okay. Cool. I really just needed to get rid of those. Strawberry tops do not go into my stock bag. No. Lamb. So. so. I want to get good sear on these. I need to lay out some paper towels here to dry these off. Now what you're going to want for this dish, pardon me, I just need to mute my microphone for a second. Even though I'm probably gonna have to wash my hands again in a second, um, what you want for this dish are lamb shoulder chops. These are significantly less expensive than lamb rib chops, or I kind of see the little tiny chops, bone-in chops. One of these are nice and meaty with some good fat and marbling. Now I'm gonna have to trim off some of that, but only after I cook them up. Besides, it's good to get a little bit of caramelized fat into your dish. Now, I'm really happy about these because they already feel like that they uh, are room temperature, so I don't have to do any extra waiting, which is good. Except, now I need to heat my pan up. So. Did I put my dish towel? There it is. Okay. So, what you're gonna need for uh, for this now? Very basic. Once I can find it. Aha. So basic, it's already sitting on my countertop, and I didn't even notice it. So, black pepper. And. Kosher salt. You need a little bit more than that, so I'm just going to grab the box I have in my pantry real quick and refill that. This is where having a Costco membership or an Amazon Prime membership really comes to your advantage because then giant box of kosher salt for under two bucks. I mean, that's cheaper than table salt. And has a lot more application to it. I mean, the reason why I use kosher salt for most of my recipes is I have a better control of salting my food. The salinity of kosher salt is less than that of table salt. It also dissolves faster, so you can add salt to taste. We're not tasting this immediately, but you know, for sauces and soups and whatnot, it dissolves pretty much immediately. So as you add salt to your mixture, you can taste it salinity. So uh, you wanna do about three finger pinch, so three fingers in your thumb. And then kind of liberally season. Now, if you're thinking this is too much, uh, once again, the salinity is not nearly that of table salt. Also, a lot of this is going to come off in the pan as I sear it. So that's why I'm being a bit liberal with it. So. And just add some fresh cracked pepper. The pepper, ricotta, and strawberry tastes amazing together. Okay, I'm just gonna rub that in. Give it a flip. Now you see why I run up to kosher salt quite a bit. So. But that's fine, because like I said, it's cheap. So. Okay. And 
now I'm just going to let that sit until I get my pan hot enough. So I'm just going to switch to my stove cam over here, which I'm not sure if it's actually... Oh, it's plugged in. Really? You're going to do this to me at this moment? Hmm. Am I missing my stove cam? Let me check my steams really quick here. Uh, hmm. Yeah, it's, it's there. Well, that's annoying. Streamlabs has decided not to turn my stove cam on. Okay, so you're going to just have to have me describing the um, sizzling to you. Great. But that's okay, because that's half of my recipe. Tell you what, I'm going to move this cam over to the stove when we need it. It's going to be annoying, but we'll try to make it work. So, right, first I just need to get my cast iron skillet. Actually, I'm going to go for the 12 inch instead of the 10 inch, this thing here. move this without knocking too much over. Yay, this is going to be fun. Um, hmm. I can do it. I can make y'all dizzy. Maybe. Right. Let's see here. That's not going to work. Okay. New plan. New plan. Maybe... Nope, that's not going to go either. Well, um... That's really annoying because you probably do need to see what I'm doing. But I'll just switch to the tripod cam during that time and describe what I'm doing. Because it seems that my uh, Streamlabs decided not to recognize my stovetop cam when I set everything up. And unfortunately, the only way to get it to reset is for me to end the stream. And I want the continuous video. So, technical difficulties, people. It happens. Mm. So, try not to set my beer down too hard so I don't have it exploding everywhere. That would be bad. Okay, so that's heating up. So I just need, need to do a little bit of a test as it heats up to figure out if it's hot enough to actually add my meat. It is not hot enough. You, what you want is a quick sizzle and the water to just kind of disappear uh, as it's, like when it's hot enough to add. It's not at that point yet. It happens. So, do, 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 do. Um, I can get a little bit. Oh, right. I can get a little bit of cleanup, and also I need to make up my herb cheese. So let's go ahead and start doing that. Let's get this out of the way. Move it to where it's needed, which is next to the stove top, and. Add. Let's see here, I think I'm gonna want about hmm. I think I'm gonna want about a cup and a half of cheese. Well, let's see, that's about twelve. I can get about a tablespoon worth of cream each. Quick calculation, so a quarter of a cup, about four tablespoons, so for 12, I'm going to need three quarters of a cup. So, standard for what I do with this particular cream is about a two to one ratio, two parts cream cheese, one part ricotta to add a little bit of liquidiness, but still maintain that structure the cream cheese has. So, for three quarters of a cup, 
Um, that's actually stupid easy. I'm just gonna need about half a cup of cream cheese and a quarter of a cup of fresh ricotta, of, uh, ricotta cheese. So if you're taking notes at home, quarter cup of ricotta cheese and half a cup of cream cheese. So, mm, I should probably actually turn my kitchen vent on. So yeah, I just have to remember how much. A quarter of a cup. So an ounce is about two tablespoons. A quarter of a cup is about three tablespoons. No, four tablespoons. So I'm gonna need about eight tablespoons worth. Eight divided by two is six. I'm gonna need six ounces. So I'm gonna need that. Six ounces. So pretty much most of that block of cream cheese. Softened, mind you. So. You see, cooking is kind of like doing game math, where you have to do all sorts of fun conversions and modifiers to get the result you need. And by all means, please do not roll a one. Unless it is a one to one conversion rate. So, cream cheese. Aha. Uh -huh. There you go. There you go. And a quarter of a cup of ricotta cheese. Ginger, how you doing? Ginger is my little calico kitty. Well, I was gonna pick up and show you, but she's just walked out of my kitchen. So, okay, that is smoking hot. So I'm just gonna switch my tripod. You might be able to hear that sizzling, but yeah, it's definitely hot enough. Turn down a little bit to about medium. Next. Add about, about a tablespoon or a half tablespoon of sesame oil. See that's that's a tablespoon. Yeah. Square containers are not meant to be held by one hand. Ah. I'm going to tell you what, I can use about two tablespoons of that. Okay. And hold on to your spoon, because you will need it. So, okay, that is getting nice and smoky. To find where the heck my oven mitt went. Ha ha, oven mitt. So gonna give that a quick swirl around the pan. And then just gonna add my chops. And you shouldn't have too much splatter because the steaks will actually be um the lamb chops will well, let me set the timer for about three and a half three minutes. I want to get these to about a medium rare temp. Oh, hello, Salami Express. Welcome back to the chat. It's lovely to see you again. Thank you for joining me. And uh, yeah, today on Munchies and Minis, we are making Dragonborn's Delicacy, which is based off the Dragonborn race on D&D. I was going off of Forgotten Realms campaign. Actually, no, I still need my sesame oil, so I'm just going to keep that out. So yeah, um, so a little bit off the Forgotten Realms campaign. 
where the essentially green fields, the bread basket of the dragon, um, dragonborn capital, uh, is known for producing um, rice, sesame seeds, go uh, goat, sheep, cows, and all that. So, and also, dragonborn are meticulous in their in their crafting. They like to do things in a very refined and expert way. So we're doing kind of an elevated version of a far on kind of a peasant dish of just kind of meat, cheese, and bread. Combined with some ingredients that the real world equivalent of a uh, dragonborn, i.e. a bearded dragon, would find delicious. Now don't feed this whole dish to your bearded dragon. Just uh, the leftovers, you know, mustard, um, is it mu wait, do I have stove? No. Uh, mustard greens, strawberries, and fresh herbs. Don't include the cheese. Um, I just mixed up about ricotta, a, a bit of ricotta and um, cream cheese together. And now I'm gonna take my hand mixer and make it a tasty, tasty whipped farmer's type cheese. Oh man, that lamp smells amazing. So, yeah, being half Romanian, it's like, oh, well, I don't eat meat. It's okay, I make lamb. Yeah, um, lamb is my specialty. Never played Dragon Ball, but I'm interested in what I'm making. Well, thank you. Um, yeah. My cream cheese might be a little not soft yet. Not to worry. Not to worry. Because I'm going to fix that with some microwave magic. For about 12 seconds. Well, 10. Let's see how we're doing. Are you soft enough yet? No, you're not. Okay. And I really wish I could show you what's on my stove top right now. But my stove cam doesn't seem to be linked up at the moment, so. So yeah, I did about three and a half minutes on one side to sear. And now I'm just doing that again for another three and a half minutes. Now let's see if my cheese is soft enough to whip. Oh yeah, that should work just fine. So, so yeah, in this bowl I've got a mix of ricotta cheese, chopped basil, and fresh thyme. So yeah, I'm kind of making sort of a farmer's cheese equivalent with that with some tasty basil and thyme, which bearded dragons can definitely eat. I'm gonna eat and watch your stream till I pass out. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you for joining me on tonight's episode of Munchies and Minis. All right, that looks good. Ah, 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 stop. You shall do as I say. Okay, see how we doing on the lamb? Still has about two and a half minutes left on it. Okay, and choom make sure I've got it all marked down right. So let's see, three and a half minutes on each side. And about, let's see, say about four tablespoons sesame oil divided. Two in the pan for the steak. Well, lamb. And the other two is going to be for the mustard greens. So, right, do a little bit of cleanup around my kitchen. Oh my god, that smells good. Not going to lie, I can't wait to eat that. My husband's giving me the thumbs up and pointing to his nose and saying that it smells really good. Uh, speaking of smelling things, I need to blow my nose, so I'm just going to mute the microphone for a second.
Okay. So yes, I can breathe now. Mm. Ooh, okay. I've got about a minute left on that lamb. So that's the cheese. Take a what? Okay. What size? Bachelor. Cheese. Right. Don't need that anymore. I can just clean that off and throw it in the wash. Yeah, get off of my twist, dang it. Ah. You know what? I don't like you either. But you taste delicious. All right. Okay. So, all right, the lamb is done. With uh, cooking, I believe. So now I'm just gonna put this on my cutting board here and let that rest as I'm doing the rest of my dish. So just going to put this to the side until that point. Next up, I still have a ton of drippings and sesame oil left over in there. So I just need to add my mustard greens to that. Lower my heat down too low so it doesn't just, you know, burn or fry too much. Also, there's a lot of moisture in these greens, so I kind of need to let that cook off so I don't have it um, splattering all over the place. Not muted for my... Oh, God, I'm sorry. Oh, gosh. Wow. I heard your snot ricochet. Yay, that's... Oh, boy. oh. Sorry. Sorry about that. Um, tonight in the Gluttonous Geek presents Munchies and Minis. I embarrass myself in multiple ways. All right. So yeah, those mustard greens are just cooking down for me. I'm gonna stir them to coat them in that, those lamb drippings and sesame oil. Kinda just wilts a bit. Okay. Now, what I need to do is for one, pinch of salt, two, add about two more, oh, maybe about one more. thing of sesame oil. Coat that. And then, since rice is considered one of the crops from um, the green fields, I'm using some mirror, which is some sweet rice wine. Give that a quick splash to help balance the flavors a little bit, because mustard greens on their own tend to be kind of bitter. A little bit of more salt to draw that out. That and also adds a nice acidic plate, uh, element. So now I'm just gonna stir that about, wilt it down further, until all of that moisture just kind of absorbs. And I think we are done with our greens. So going to scoop that into a mixing bowl here. Let that cool off some. And since I don't really need my uh, pan 
time for anything else, I'm going to show you quickly on how to clean it off. So the pan is definitely nice and hot. I'm trying to heat up a little bit more at the moment. But yeah, as you can see, wilted greens. So yeah, I'm going to show you quickly how to clean that um, Clean that off. You got your oven mitts. You need two of them. Cold water. Hot pan. And this isn't terribly hot, but there's not that much in to clean off. Usually, you want a bit hot, like, uh, hotter than this to help release everything from the bottom of the pan. Now, I'm just going to stick that back on the burner, dry off just a little bit, and then you want two paper towels. One, to give it a quick dry off, and two, cooking spray. Give it a quick once or two over. And just wipe that all over the surface that you had used earlier. Turn your heat off. And then push the pan to a back burner or unused burner to let it cool off. So, cast iron cooking. That's why I love it practically why my skillets live on the stovetop. So yeah, now that that's done, I'm also going to need to toast my bread up. So... Do I think I might be able to fit all of these in my toaster oven. So... What I want to do... prep cam. So you know, no, I still want these toasted to absorb that excess moisture. So just to make cleanup quick. Oh, hi, Ginger. She's returned. Hey, princess. Okay. So, hey, buddy girl. This is Ginger. She's my little baby kitty girl. She's about 20 years old. My sweet princess. So yeah, she also likes to shed on things <laughs> and use my anti-fatigue mat as her bed. So yeah, every time I try to go for something like tin foil or parchment paper, there's a ginger. But that's okay because she's my little baby princess and I love her. No right, little girl. Yeah as she stalks out of the kitchen rather indignantly. Right, so, tin foil. Oh, excuse me, aluminum foil. We're being technical here. Okay, so. All right. What was I doing? Cooking spray. I'm just gonna arrange all my bread slices onto there. As best as I can. Oh, right, prep cam. There you go. All right. So, just gonna get these a quick spray. And 
then into the toaster oven. Still on toast, right? Yes. Okay. And you want to toast that for about, oh goodness, if you're going to do a low broil, I would say about two to three minutes on each side. Um, so I'm using a toaster oven. I might be okay with just, you know, letting it toast and it'll toast on both sides, but we'll see in about a minute. Uh, in the meantime, um, I should probably check on my lamb to see if it's rested long enough to start slicing up. So there we go. looks good. I think it's been about five minutes at this point. It certainly feels cool enough. So what you want to do is slice all the meat off the bones. So we're just going to do that. And slice it thinly like this. The trouble with the shoulder chop is there is quite a bit of bone to work around. So That's okay, because most of it's going to kind of separate like that for you. And don't toss those bones away quite yet. Honestly, there's those are some of the best part. I love about bones like this marrow. I'm take an extra fork and get that out myself. So, admittedly there's not really any dignified way <laughs> of eating this. You can get this out with a chopstick. Okay. <laughs> Delicious. Mm. Bone marrow. get any out of that, but meh. At least I got some out. But yeah, I'm just going to reserve that bone too, the bone too for uh, my stock bag. Which looks like the stock bag I have going uh, about now is going to be a tasty chicken and lamb stock, so I'm all for that. With lots of bell peppers. actually eat with that fork because that was not the one I was intending to use. Okay. Well, like I said, this doesn't have to look pretty. It just has to work because once everything is done with this, it's going to look pretty. It's going to look pretty and taste amazing. So... Right now, I just want to make sure that I have enough 
meat and fat for all 12 pieces of bread. So. It's like use my hands. <laughs> well, yeah. I think I might just save this big chunk of fat for myself. It's the, uh, it's the chef's tax. Great. Now this is eating pork. Eh. Mmm. Oh my god. Yep. Good tax. Did my camera stop working? Oh, you gotta be kidding me. Oh my god, really? You gotta be kidding me. Okay. Um, it might just be on my end. Uh, let, guys, let me know if my camera's working. Currently having faux. Okay. Um. 0% drop frames. Okay, maybe it's just on my end. Or, let's see. Maybe it's just the... Not working. Brilliant. Okay, well, uh, it looks like I'm going to have to end the stream and then restart it. So, um, let's do that. I'll be on in literally probably about five seconds. Well, actually, 20 seconds because I'm going to have to restart Streamless. I'll be right back. That, um, yeah. Streamlabs sucks and I hate it. Um, so yeah, hopefully I didn't lose any of you um, as I continue to slice up some meat. Um, I am not happy with this, obviously. Okay. So yeah, um, hopefully you're back or we'll come back. Um, now where we left off, we had just made a our lamb and cheese and all that. Now I'm just slicing up the lamb. And yeah, I'm seriously considering getting rid of Streamlabs as well as my OBS, which is gonna be a pain in the butt because I know that I'm gonna need to recreate all of my scenes in a different software. But yeah, I mean, between not picking up my stove co uh, top cam, which, by the way, it works now. <laughs> um, and then just like freezing all of my video. It's just, it ain't cool. It's just, it's not cool. It's not cool at all. Okay. All right. That's gonna be chef's tax once again. Chef's tax. Just need to slice that all up. Cut on the bias so it's against the grain. There we go. Usually you have an idea of whether it's against or with the grain, depending on how much trouble it gives you. Right. 
just gonna put that to the side. Don't worry, you didn't touch any of it. Okay. And let's check on my bread. Try to make sure you don't hear it. back. So, check on that bread. How toasted are we? Are we toasted enough? No, I'm going to need to flip that over and give the other side a quick toast. So yeah, you're going to need about two to three minutes on each side. up like with the sesame oil for example. I'll stop being gross. Mm. Damn, that's delicious. Still mine. Okay, so, right. Back to what we were doing. I'm gonna need to start doing some assembly. So now, I'm just gonna put things away that need to be put away. all these things on. So, that, plate out here. Also going to need my sesame seeds, which are in here somewhere. Uh -huh. Here we are. I'm just going to pour, uh, say about a tablespoon, probably more like a teaspoon's worth of black sesame, well, toasted sesame seeds. That's about a tablespoon or two. I'm not going to end up using all of this, but it's going to be for garnish, so I want to be able to manipulate that with that a little bit. Uh, let's see here. Bread, are you finished? Okay, yeah, that bread's definitely finished. So, better tongs than that. Here we go. Or I can just do that. It has the same effect. Yeah. There we go. Alright. So, now that we have our bread, we just need to do some quick arranging. greens, got our strawberries, sprouts, and alfalfa sprouts, cheese mixture. I just need to grab a tablespoon. And a tasting spoon to help scoop this out. So yeah, a tablespoon of our cheese mixture. that out and spread it with my other spoon. And 
and just repeat that for each piece of toast. As you see, this cheese mixture is actually covering up holes, so it's able to hold on to whatever I put in a little bit better. If you pump this out right, you should have exactly the amount you need. And granted, you're going to have to scrape the bottom of the bowl at this after a point to make sure of that because it's kind of gone everywhere. So, there we go. Layer one. Next. Try to just sort of 
divvy up the greens you have. For a little bit onto each piece. Don't need a whole lot, just a little bit. Just enough so that every piece has a little bit of the sesame wilted mustard grains. And you can, you know, use your fingers. You know, as long as they're clean. might actually end up with a bit left over and that's perfectly fine. You don't necessarily have to use it all. Okay. Next, we're going to add our lamb. So, just going to pile on as much as we can to each piece. don't have to use all of it. I mean, you can always save what's left over for your own little meal. Okay. That should do. All right, and now, bit of small tiny pinch of sprouts. Probably should have done that before lamb actually to help hold it down some. You're probably going to need about, I would say, a quarter to half a cup of alfalfa sprouts total. Okay, there we go. Looking good. Okay, now we can add our strawberries. Turn that upside. 
upside down because that looks a little nicer. dry because I need to do the final garnish and that is our sesame seeds. So I'm just gonna drop some on each morsel. Okay. I can I think those are good to go. So there you go. Dragonborn's Delight. A mix of herb cream cheese with strawberries, sesame, um, sautéed lamb shoulder and mustard greens, um, basil, sorry, thyme, French baguettes, and uh, some strawberries and sesame seeds. So there you go. Okay, so I've got, goodness, I've got about 15 minutes left on here. Um, I should probably do a little bit of painting while I still can. First, I just need to do a quick round of cleanup. Where are you? Oh, thank you. Um, salt dish, salt dish, holy thing of salt dish. Ah, it's behind me, of course. All right. Let's see, okay, ads over. <laughs> All right. Hopefully, didn't miss anything too important. Um, Actually, I should get my paint plating too while I'm thinking about it. I have to pick out which ones look the prettiest to go on my main plate. That that's what the photo is going to be of. So, let's see here. So far, I really like this one. Ah, except that I totally broke the bread. Eh, that works. So yeah, that one with. Ah. Stuff keep falling over. And maybe. Yeah! Get back on there. I command you. Okay. Ooh. Actually, I really like that one. So. Oh, I probably want to go for similar looking pieces. So. Let's go with this one. Okay, that looks. Perfect. Yeah, here I'll, I'll uh, bring the camera in close so you can see what it's going to look like. Or let's get an idea of what it's going to look like once the photo. So, let's see here. Well, that's upside down. So, maybe something like that. Or you know what? I can just go to my tripod cam. Let's do that. Tripod. Eh. So, this is what it's going to look like, kind of, in the photos. Pretty, right? Granted, I'm going to be able to arrange just a bit more. I might even do a bit of a spiral. Come to think of it. Maybe. Oh yeah, that. I'll play around with it some. Hey, who told you you can go? Stay. Cool. So yeah, just gonna move that over here. Actually, grab one of these for my own dinner, because I've not eaten dinner. Let's get to painting. 
you have great patience, I probably eat half of that before plating. Oh gosh, yeah, I've, <laughs> um, honestly, just your brain, your gaze just starts to glaze over after a bit, especially, oh man, uh, yeah. <laughs> Though that's kind of also why I dug into the lamb a little bit first, um, which I'm still going to dig into because mm, lamb is my favorite. Mm. Lamb is my favorite animal protein. Don't see that. Um, mm. Dang it, that's good. But I also know that lamb does require patience. This thing is, lamb is actually a lot easier to cook than a lot of people think. It's just once you find out the one main method of doing it, of doing certain cuts, then you're pretty much good. Or one or two ways. Like, um, mostly when I do lamb, I make rack of lamb. It's because I can get rack of lamb easily and somewhat less expensive at Costco and that and if you ever want to impress somebody for, um, with your culinary skills on uh, something that looks a lot harder than it actually is rack of lamb is really um, really a good go-to because all you really have to do is just you know put whatever you're seasoning it with on it roast it in the oven until it's about, God, I think about 145 degrees, medium rare, and then you let it rest before slicing. So since I am not patient enough to um, find my chair, I'm going to be painting while standing today. So water. As my cat, what are you eating, little Carol? I guess some of the lamb fat must have dripped on the floor. That is perfectly fine. You know, Ginger, you've been, it's like, I haven't touched anything besides the basic proteins, poultry, pork, beef, fish. Yeah, um, lamb is, you kind of hold on to that more for special occasions, admittedly, because it tends to be a bit more expensive, especially here in the States. Um, but it's got a really great flavor if you cook it right. Um, but yeah, uh, Goodness, I, I'm lucky to be in Atlanta where I can get access to a lot of these protein proteins easily. Um, and if you ever want to go on kind of a culinary tour, like grocery store tour, um, if you're Atlanta, there's two places I can recommend. One is DeKalb Farmer's Market. That's where you go if you want to get as many different types of spices for as cheaply as possible. Um, as a note, um, you know cinnamon sticks when you buy them at the grocery store? They're kind of pricey, right? Well, at DeKalb Farmer's Market, you can get a bag about this big for about $3.50. There is a wall of spices. Wall of it. Also, their produce is pretty inexpensive, too. The other place would be Buford, Farmer, Buford Highway Farmer's Market. That's where I got most of my produce today from. Uh, they have practically every kind of produce available. I'm not kidding. Um, let's see, are we dying eggs with that deviled eggs dish? Um, I, I assume that you uh, mean the Cyndaquil deviled eggs? Um, Yeah, uh, the Cyndaquil deviled eggs are actually uh, tea eggs that have been made into deviled eggs. So it's kind of dyeing the eggs a little bit because you kind of smash up the shell of it after hard boiling to let it soak in the tea and get that kind of cool veining. Um, goodness. Oh, yes, where was I? Oh, yes, painting things. I really should get another, a uh, better start on that shambling mound. Part of it. But I just, I don't feel like paint really falls evenly on these D&D &D minis. I mean, they're pre-primed, and I'm kind of almost tempted to get some cheap produce at a farmer's market. Uh, yeah, it's, it's an international farmer's market, so it's kind of a, um, 
goodness, direct supplied from farms, like, from all over the world. Um, and it's also, you can buy stuff easily in bulk. Um, it's pretty amazing. I mean, there's so many different types of fish, too, and you can buy the whole fish, and they will clean it, and gut it, and fillet it for you, too. Um, like, I managed to get like a bunch of basil about this big, like just pa like tightly packed in from the cat farmer's market once for about a dollar sixty nine. Um, let's see what else is also inexpensive there. Just, I mean, just about anything really, anything that hasn't been uh, prepped and imported. Um, but Buford Highway Farmers Market has actually a better selection of produce and the crowds are not nearly as crazy as DeKalb, especially on the weekend. Mm. Mm. Dang it, that's delicious. Okay. Yeah, I mean, if you ever wanted to make your own pesto, it's definitely a place to go because um, pine nuts are actually not too expensive there either. I mean, they're still expensive, but not nearly as so as if you just got the tiny little, um, like, just tiny little package at like a Kroger or Publix or something. So yeah, all different types of nuts. I get my hazelnuts there too. Um, like walnuts, um, Brazil nuts, just, I would say just go and stock up if you're ever in, in town and want to do that. So, right, let's get that chisel brush out because I want to, I want to fix the coloring a bit on our shambling mound here. Let's see, where is my main chisel brush? Ah, here it is. So. Let's find where I put the Buckman's Glow. Well, actually no, I'm gonna go in a darker brown for that so I can highlight with the Buckman's Glow. Where did my main brown go? I think this is, yes, Morn Fang. See, can you get saffron at the farmer's market? Cause that then costs a kidney for a gram. Uh, yep, uh, you can also get it there. It's still a bit more expensive there. Um, I will admit I'm spoiled. My aunt lives in Dubai, and she's actually coming in. She's actually coming in towards the end of this month. I'm really excited to see her. She lives in Dubai, and she brings me back spices. Like every time she comes back to visit, I just get like piles upon piles of, well, I mean bags upon bags of shawarma spices. For one, don't you dare fall on everything. Okay, and. Like I said, I'm lucky because what she also brings me might not actually be in this tub, but we'll check. Well, I know you're in here. Aha, yes. Yeah, to give you an idea, these are the kind of tubs you can get at uh, the Cap Farmer's Market. Like, just ginormous tubs. So ground coriander, 61 cents for a tub this large. Um, but yeah. Got the plug. Uh, yeah, she brings me back Iranian saffron. Oh God, did the camera stop again? Oh, you gotta be kidding me. All right, she brings me Iranian saffron. Oh, wow, this is driving me nuts, okay. So, yeah, Iranian saffron. Um, and that's not the only tin she's brought me, because, uh, and it still is very fragrant. So, yeah, I am super, super lucky to have family that live in certain places. Uh, she's actually, uh law professor out there. So, 
So yeah, she's asked that I, uh, that she comes in and I cook something for her. And partially it's because since she lives in Dubai, there's certain things she can't have while she's there. Mostly pork and alcohol. So my dad is going to be roasting up, well, not roasting up, smoking up a pork butt for her um, coming up on the 30th. Especially kind of get in the mood for 4th of July and all that. Um, and I think I might actually do a, what's it called, a probably sous vide pork, uh, pork roast loin in the... Um, Probably, I'll have to see what spices. I'm thinking maybe a chimchurri one could be pretty tasty. Either that or if I can find some pandan leaves and then just kind of put it slow roasting on the grill. Uh, pandan leaves, um, I have to see if DeKalb Farmers Market has them recently. They're this type of, um, it's kind of a seasoning leaf that's very common to Southeastern Asian cuisine. Um, it imparts kind of a rose type flavor, like a rose almond vanilla flavor to things. And you can weave the leaves together into kind of a basket, wrap it around a pork loin, wrap that in foil, and then cook it slow and slow on the grill, and it just imparts this absolutely delicious flavor. Um, Pandan is also a really taste, the, as a flavor itself, it's really delicious when mixed with coconut milk and made into popsicles. Um, if you ever find like a Korean kind of grocery store, check to see if they have like pandan popsicles because oh, they're so good. But anyway, it looks like my prep cam decided to go foobar on me, which means I can't do any painting. So since we're about three minutes left until nine, I think we're probably just gonna call it a night so I can call my husband to dinner and I can get some photos of this recipe. Um, the recipe should be posted up uh, next week. Well, the video should be posted up next week. Uh, I would say probably around Monday or Tuesday. Uh, my time got a little, cut a little short because I've got a uh, deadline on... Um, I've been writing press releases for Dragon Con and I had a deadline get pushed up to about two or three weeks early. So I have some work to do this week. Um, but... Um, this recipe will be up if you want to get the recipe card. Um, it will be up on my Ko-Fi at the same time as the blog post for it uh, next week, as well as available through my Patreon. So um, just check the links down below if you're interested in getting the recipe. Uh, thank you so much. Um, it's Salami Express for joining me, and okay, your dinner. Uh, enjoy your dinner, and good luck reaching the deadline. Thank you so much. Um, it's been a fun stream. Thank you for, for keeping a quiet stream tonight. Um, this, I am very happy with how this recipe turned out. And you all have a good night. Um, and you get some rest, you. I uh, see that you're exhausted. So I'll catch you next week. This has been the Gluttonous Geek Presents Munchies and Minis. Have a great night.